Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. First Thessalonians chapter 5, the day of the Lord. If you're listening to this series of messages online, you'll notice a difference in the audio quality between 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5. And the reason is I'm recording this many years after the original because the original 1 Thessalonians 5 is missing. Never got recorded or it got deleted or what have you. So we are doing a makeup session specifically on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, so that we can fill in this gap in the series of online messages. So we will consider the day of the Lord from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we'll look at the following subtopics to wrap our hearts and our minds around this very important chapter. First, the timing of of his return, and by his return, I'm talking about the return of Christ, the return of Jesus, the timing of his return, and secondly, how then should we live, how how should we live and how should we conduct ourselves as we wait for the return of the Lord, and then we will look at spirit, soul, and body, what the scriptures have to say about how we are constructed, how we are created. And I think that will be a good review if you are if you are already familiar with that teaching. And I've done some teaching, some topical studies. I think I have an audio program on spirit, soul, and body. But this will be a good uh, quick review of that very important teaching that gives us greater understanding into how we are made, how we are constructed. And um, so I think that will be uh, that will be interesting to look at. If you've never heard of it, then uh, you'll really want to make sure to um, take notes or listen very carefully to that section. Very brief, but very, very important. Well, before we jump into 1 Thessalonians 5, because we are also recording this live, I think I think it's uh, even though it's a makeup class, we should probably give some context. Um, Probably the worst thing you can do in terms of Bible study is read one verse out of context. The next worst thing you can do is read one chapter out of context. Uh, So I'd like to um, since we're jumping right in here, I'd like to go back and just kind of bring us up to date through first Thessalonians four to some things that were previously discussed and um, uh, I think that will be a, a good review, and we'll do it quickly. Um, first of all, the context of First Thessalonians, and a lot of scholars believe that perhaps this was Paul's first letter. In other words, it's one of the oldest letters. It's one of the first ones that he wrote. And this letter was written to a relatively young congregation, or ecclesia, assembly, of Gentile Christians in Thessaloniki, Greece. And that's a it's a neat city. It's still in existence there in Greece. Uh, but this was Paul's first letter, we think, we believe, and again written to Gentile Christians. So very different from the last time we looked at it looked at Romans, and that was written to Jewish, a mixture of Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome. So this is different people, different place, and um, different set of problems, <laughs> right? Because a lot of these letters were written, if most of them, if not all of them, were written to solve some kind of a problem, answer a question, and um, and that 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 that's actually good. Um, and we have problems and we have questions, it causes us to seek the Lord for wisdom and for answers. When people ask me questions, it causes me to pray and to study and to really draw out 
wisdom from the Lord and knowledge that would not have been called upon if it were not for some specific question or problem that uh, I, I want God's wisdom in. And so um, let's don't be afraid of those questions and those problems, but let's see them as opportunities uh, to to get into the word of God, to get before the Lord in prayer and get his wisdom and understanding in these things. And so uh, these problems and concerns and questions um, were the impetus, the motivation for, I would think, probably all of the letters in the New Testament. So this young congregation, this young ecclesia in Thessaloniki, like many of the Greeks that Paul worked with and and that Paul taught, uh, they were idol worshipers, many of them before they believed in Jesus. And so uh, in Thessalonians, in the first chapter, in number nine, verse nine, it says, um, well, verse eight, your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So uh, they apparently from uh, from this writing and from these verses, we know and Paul acknowledges that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So these were young, young uh, believers in Jesus who used to be idol worshipers. And so Paul's purpose here is to encourage them in their faith and help them to grow spiritually and to give them some practical instruction, instruction for how they should now live in holiness because they they did not have the law of Moses to give them commandments and instructions, uh, and because they came from an idol worshiping background, which I, I don't I haven't studied it in depth, but I don't think that there was a great moral code or commandment attached to idol worshiper or uh, idol worshiping people. Uh, I, I think it's it's mostly about fear and appeasement, appeasing the God of, of whatever so that you can receive in return uh, favor and blessing and, and prosperity. And it's it's not really based on a any sort of moral standard. And so to turn from idols to the living God, that's quite a radical transformation. And Paul wants to encourage them and also give them some practical instruction on how how they should be living, how they should be walking in the Lord. So that's a process. We don't automatically just know that. And um, often religion leads us astray from the simplicity of Christ. But we also know from chapter 1 that the Thessalonians were expecting the soon return of Christ. And Paul mentions this here. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and, true God, and to wait for his son from heaven. So this was a fundamental belief and expectation on the part of these young believers uh, one of the concerns that they had is is the background of this letter is found in uh, chapter 4 in verse 13, where Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So the concern there, and it makes sense, the, Thess the Thessalonians were expecting the soon return of Christ, and they were concerned that those of their ecclesia who had already died would somehow miss out on this wonderful return of Jesus. And so Paul is answering them in chapter 4, and this is what sets us up for chapter 5, 
and what we will study this week. But he's answering them in chapter four that if you are a believer in Jesus, even if you die, you're you're not going to miss out on the joy and the celebration of the return of Christ, because Paul explains that if you die in the Lord, it says that those who are dead in Christ will also be raised at that time so that um, the dead in Christ will rise first, he says. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 16, and then chapter 17, we who are, or verse 17, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord." So, and he says, comfort one another with these words. So, um, they were, um, I think they were doing like a lot of people tend to do, and that is to overthink things, um, rather than just focus on the return of Christ and the, and that great celebration, they're overthinking with a lot of questions about what about the ones who have already died and, um, Paul says, don't worry about it, because this is going to be a grand reunion. The dead in Christ are going to rise, and we are going to be joined together with them and with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So comfort one another with these words. God's got it worked out. No one's going to miss out. You're not going to be disappointed, and it's just going to be a great time of celebration and worship together. Uh, so it, it, again, I mean, you can take this literally and and just trust in the promise of God, or you can overthink it and try to rationalize it and figure it out. Uh, but uh, you just have to decide for yourself. Do you believe the scriptures? Do you believe the word of God? If so, then just take what the word of God says and comfort yourself and comfort one another with these words. Or you can find fault, pick it apart, rationalize it, explain it away, and say it doesn't really mean what it actually says. You have to make that decision on your own. But this is what inspires Paul to to explain to them that the Lord himself is is descending from heaven with a shout. And, and so in, in my view, in my opinion, I don't see any kind of symbolism here. I don't think it represents some kind of a a mysterious or mystical experience. When Paul says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, I don't see how you could uh, take that as a figurative uh, or metaphorical expression. It's the Lord himself who descends from heaven. The dead in Christ will be raised and all of us will meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So with this understanding, and if we get that far in our faith and in our understanding of the return of Christ, and you notice I haven't used the word rapture because the word rapture is not used in Scripture, and this word rapture uh, tends to refer to or is used to refer to a particular doctrine or an extrapolation and interpretation of Scripture that is not necessarily accurate, specifically the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And um, Scripture does not talk about the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That's a label that Bible teachers and and prophecy uh, teachers have put upon this timeline and this chain of events that ties in a lot of different teachings together and and puts it under this umbrella called the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Scripture doesn't teach it. I'm saying that's just a, a patchwork quilt of a lot of different teachings that have been assembled together like a jigsaw puzzle And then on the box, you put this label on it, pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And I'm saying that's an interpretation. That's not something scripture teaches. It is something that 
has been interpreted and then becomes a teaching. And uh, I've got lots of uh, issues with that particular teaching. I don't think it's accurate, but uh, mostly because it goes beyond what Scripture teaches about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, the return of Christ. Uh, Scripture does not distinguish between multiple returns of Jesus, one to get his church, one to judge the world, one to rule and to reign, one, you know, uh, one at the beginning, one at the middle, one at the end, or whatever the timing is. It only recognizes a single day of the Lord. And if you study this out, it's all referring to the same event. So a lot of this has been handed down to us, and it becomes um, it, it becomes a religious tradition that is not well supported in Scripture. I read something the other day that I thought was a really good assessment. It says that we are we have become Christians have become really good at quoting the Bible and not really good at reading the Bible or studying the Bible in context. And uh, I'm paraphrasing that quote, and I don't know who said it, but I thought it was a, a good observation. Because when you read these books and follow these teachings, especially if you if you still attend church or if you watch uh, uh, Christian television, you'll find that people are really good at pulling out individual verses to support some kind of a doctrine, some kind of a teaching, some viewpoint, some opinion. And uh, by pulling these verses out of context and stringing them together, you can almost get the Bible to say whatever you want it to say. But Christians, rather than studying this, these scriptures and, and um, reading them in context, they, they tend just to quote these same verses and, and spit these uh, quotes back to you to the point that they really don't know what they're talking about other than they just know how to quote the verses that seem to support a particular viewpoint. And I think uh, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is a great example. Uh, but there's lots of examples in the religious system. I'm saying go beyond. Don't be content to just be able to quote Bible verses. There was a, a Bible teacher on television who was well known for being able to quote rapidly one verse right after the other from memory. Well, the, super. That's great. I think you should um, be familiar with the Word of God. But just to quote verses, uh, individual single verses out of context and string them together in a way that um, is not is in a way that is not faithful to the context of what you're talking about. I, I think that's disingenuous and it doesn't really help. Particularly if people without understanding uh, just uh, repeat those verses. And um, very often, and, and I experience this and, and maybe you've experienced it as well, when you try to give people a, a teaching and go through and, and show them something from Scripture, uh, very often, I've seen that people will dismiss it because of a single verse. You know, well, what about this verse? And, and so uh, by taking one verse or even two verses and uh, what, what about five or six verses? But that's the only thing they can say. All they can do is quote verses at you. They have no understanding of what they're reading or what they're studying. So I'm saying let's go beyond that, let's grow beyond that, and let's use wisdom. Now, the natural question that arises as we're talking about the return of Christ, and this explains a lot of these teachings that have come up, the natural question is when? When will Jesus return? If we assume that the Bible is true and, and if we accept what the Bible says, that Jesus is returning, and he will return, then the natural question is when? And this is what Paul begins to address in the current chapter that we are studying, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So I hope by now you have turned to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll start reading in verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren... 
you have no need that I should write to you. And he is specifically referring to the return of Christ. That's how he ends in chapter 4. So concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let those who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So the timing of Christ's return. When is Jesus going to return? This has been a subject of speculation for centuries, for 2,000 years, in fact. There's no doubt that even, uh, even the early ecclesia believed in the imminent return of Christ in their lifetime. Now, as it turned out, that didn't happen. But it's it may be true that perhaps every generation since Jesus has eagerly expected the same thing, that Jesus would return in their lifetime. And that has certainly uh, fueled a lot of speculation. And uh, everyone believes that they are the generation that is going to witness the return of the Lord. And in one sense, I think that's great. I don't think there's anything wrong with having faith and belief so strong that that you are hopeful and confident, even to the point of believing that Jesus may return in your lifetime. And uh, look, I have that hope myself. I'm just pointing out that so did the early Christians and perhaps every generation who takes God's word seriously, who believes in the promises of God. I think it's it's proper and it's and it's uh, it's evidence of faith and trust. That that you believe in the imminent return of Jesus, and you certainly hope and pray as part of our daily prayers. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That certainly includes the return of Christ to rule the nations. So, yes, it is. It is uh, certainly what scripture refers to as a blessed hope. I'm just pointing out that every generation has eagerly expected the same thing. It hasn't happened yet. That doesn't mean that it can't happen. Perhaps today, perhaps this year, perhaps in our lifetime, perhaps not. But the point is, concerning the times and the seasons, we have no idea. And that is just the way it should be. Because what happens is, when you begin to speculate on the exact timing of Christ's return, as many have, then I think that distracts you from from what you are here to do, and it's not to try and guess when Jesus is going to return. But that has not prevented people, particularly in the last 150 years, from speculating on the exact date that they believe that Jesus is returning. And to, to show you that this is nothing new and extraordinary, We'll just go back in the last 150 years and make a few quick uh, notations here of people who became notable and notorious for attempting to predict the exact date of Christ's return. William Miller 
Adventist said that Jesus was returning March 21st, 1844. Now, all of them have great calculations. They have great rationalizations for why this is. And um, I just want to point out that it, it all of them were wrong. So <laughs> when uh, Jesus didn't return on March 21st, William Miller revised his prediction and said, oh, it's, it's not March 21st, it's April the 18th, 1844. And so that didn't happen. Samuel Snow, I don't know who he is, but he made a prediction October 22nd, 1844 was when Jesus would return. For some reason, 1844 was uh, very a very important year for uh, Bible teachers and prophecy teachers. And um, all I can tell you is that nothing happened in 1844. A little more in the modern era, the 20th century, William Branham, he was a little more general, but he said that Jesus would return no later than 1977. Well, he certainly missed the boat on that. Then Hal Lindsey, who's still around, still writing books, still appearing on Christian television, as far as I know. He had a popular book back in the 70s, The Late Great Planet Earth. And he's made more than one prediction about Christ's return. First, he said it would be no later than 1980. Then he said it would be no later than 1988. And, of course, that didn't happen. Pat Robertson got in on the act, and he predicted Jesus would return no later than 1982. And when that didn't, that didn't happen, and so then he said it would be no later than 2007. And just got to say, uh, for purposes of recording, here we are in 2020, and... Um, those predictions of Christ's return have long since expired. Lester Summerall, another Bible prophecy teacher, he said it would be no later than 1985. When that did not transpire, he then said it would be no later than 2000, and both of those predictions were wrong. There is an Edgar Wisnant who had a real flair for uh, numbers, I suppose, at least being reflected in the title of his book. Very catchy, 88 Reasons Jesus Will Return in 1988. <laughs> so for all of these reasons and rationales and calculations, Jesus did not return in 1988. But you see, do you see a pattern here? Harold Camping, which some of you may be familiar with, a uh, radio Bible teacher, made the news by predicting Jesus would return on September the 6th, 1994, led many people astray. Well, then he made another prediction May 21st, 2011, led even more people astray, and that didn't happen. Well, not to be outdone, he made a third prediction, October 21st, 2011. And, of course, that did not transpire either. Then the secular world got all excited about a Mayan prophecy that um, apparently said that the world would end on December 21st, 2012. And for that reason... A lot of Christians and Bible prophecy teachers speculated that Jesus would certainly return before the end of the world. And so, therefore, uh, Jesus would return in 2012 or before December, no later than December 21st, 2012. And that never happened. Well, and then more recently, as a, a character by the name of David Mead who claims to be a Christian numerologist, but he's not using his real name, so we really don't know who he is. But he made uh, international news by predicting, well, he's made several predictions. He, he has predicted that um, the Earth would be destroyed because of a, of a rogue planet. And uh, he gave a date when that would happen. 
And uh, he's made several predictions, but the one that got him in the news, I think, the most was the prediction that Jesus would return on April 23rd, 2018. And of course, that didn't happen. But um, as as we review all of these different predictions, and I'm sure that there have been others that I have failed to mention, but this just gives you an idea of of some recent speculations of Christ's return. So I'm saying this has been a fascination for people uh, for many years, many centuries, in fact. And I'm saying that it is exactly contrary to Scripture to even try and set a date. So why do they do it? Well, that's a good question, and I can't uh, read their mind. But I think they do it out of ignorance. I think they do it out of uh, fascination. Some of them do it to gain a following to to go after themselves. And uh, some of them are probably are just genuinely deceived, uh, self-deluded. Perhaps it's a combination of all the above, but I share this so that we will be aware and not be led astray, because I'm sure this will not be the end of such speculations. And all of these speculations ignore the very basic facts of Scripture that says We're not going to know the day or the hour. We are not going to know the times or the seasons of Christ's return. Paul was very clear in his teaching, and and, uh, not just here, but elsewhere. But he said that the Thessalonians knew perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. And that phrase is something that Jesus himself used. He first used a thief in the night to describe his own return in Luke 12, 36 through 40. So we're we're not. um, I think scripture is very clear and Jesus is very clear that he is returning. But the day, the time, the season, the hour of his return, it's not for us to know the times and the seasons, he says in Acts 1 and 6 and 7. He specifically says in response to his disciples who said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And that's not specifically in this context a question regarding his return, because I'm not sure that they really grasped that he was going away and would return until after he had already ascended. But in answer to their question, Jesus specifically said it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father has put into his own hands it's not for you to know the times or the seasons and so that's connected i think that answers any speculation about future events Um, and specifically the return of christ that we're just not going to know and that's by divine design (laughs) Because think about it, if we did know the time of his return, uh, that would really that would really change our attitude and and our behavior and our faith in ways that uh, could be very detrimental, unpredictable. There are just some things that the Lord has reserved that he's just not going to share with us. And one of them is the timing of his return. Peter taught the same thing in um, 2 Peter 3. In verse 10, he says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And it talks about some some other things there about the heavens passing away with a great noise and elements melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. I mean, you know, so this is a, a topic that we would have to really develop Uh, to get you to see how all of these different descriptions of the Lord's return actually uh, fit together into a single event. I think one of the great mistakes that people have made in the past is every time they see something described in Scripture, instead of seeing how it reconciles and relates with other 
different descriptions of the same thing. They just automatically assume it's talking about something different when very often it is um, it is speaking of the same event, but just giving different perspective, different perspectives on the same event. So the point is this this whole thing of Jesus returning as a thief in the night. This is the words Jesus used. It's the words Paul used. It's the words Peter used. And so this was well known. And Paul says, even to the Thessalonians, that you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So you're not going to know. And that's by divine design. All right, so I mentioned Jesus. I mentioned Peter. John also taught the exact same thing in uh, Revelation 16, 16. Revelation 16, 16. Well, that's the wrong reference, but it's um, Revelation 16, 15. Okay, so we just got one digit wrong there in the slide. It's Revelation 16, 15, and this is John's uh, quoting the words of Jesus. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And that is during the bowl judgments. So you can disagree about the timing if you want, but the thing that is very clear from Scripture, Jesus, Paul, Peter, and John, they all refer to the return of Jesus as a thief in the night. And part of the reason for that is you don't know when the thief is coming. Jesus says if you knew when the thief was coming, then you would you would you know, keep an eye out for him and he would not take you by surprise. The reason the thief comes in the night is to catch you while you are asleep and to to take you by surprise. So it's not that Jesus is, is uh, trying to um, mislead or scare people or catch them off guard and surprise them in that sense, but he's just saying that it's going to be like in the days of Noah, everyone is going about their own business, doing their own thing, buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage. And they were caught off guard until the flood came and took them all away. Um, so the point is that the timing of his return is not something that we can know, and therefore it is not something that we should speculate about. So the thief comes secretly and unexpectedly and without warning. He does not announce his presence before he shows up. And so in the same way, we cannot know. And so we shouldn't try and speculate the timing, the specific timing of Christ's return. Instead, what what the early Christians understood is that they should live in such a way that they are ready at all times. To live in a way that you are faithful, going about your business, being res- living in a, a responsible, holy life, living in a godly way, so that you are ready at whatever time. If if he does return today, wonderful. If he, if he returns this year, wonderful. If he returns in your lifetime, great. But it's not going to change your day-to-day living in the sense that You're walking in the spirit. You're walking in holiness. You're walking in love. And this is what Paul is talking about here. You, brethren, he says, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So really what he's getting at is it's going to catch the world off guard. But those of us who believe, those of us who are walking in the light, it should not come of it at it of, should not be surprising to us in the least when Jesus returns. Why? Because we are expecting his return. The difference is we don't know when. And so we have this expectancy and this hope that we carry with us. And it teaches us to live in such a way that we are glory glorifying the Lord and honoring him in all that we say and do as people who are ready and wide awake. And Paul begins to develop this whole idea. This is the first mention of what we call spiritual armor. 
Verse 8, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. So, in other words, live as though Jesus could return at any moment, because he could return at any moment. And if you're in the light and you, you are expecting his imminent return, then you're going, you're, you will live and conduct yourself in a way so that you will not be ashamed at his return. Whenever that is, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, during your lifetime, or in another generation. So developing that is is the idea of how then should we be living, and Paul has already uh, began to explain to them, because they are in the light, it's going to take those in darkness by surprise when the Lord returns, but we expect his return, we just don't know when it's going to be. So the main idea here is not to live differently because Jesus could return unexpectedly, but to live differently because we are children of light. So we're not going going to change our behavior because we're afraid Jesus is going to return at any minute. We're living differently because we are children of light and not children of darkness. And so he says, don't be drunk, be, be sober, be alert, be watchful. But there's no hint there that we should be fearful. So if, if you are fearful of the Lord's imminent return, then uh, you, you've got a bigger issue to deal with. You need to find out why that is. I've had people write in to me and say that they are living in fear because uh, they're afraid that they're going to be left behind or that they're not going to be ready. And um, I think that fear reflects uh, that uh, religious system, that legalism of religion and those false teachings and all the movies and books and, and things that have been produced that um, dramatize this idea of millions of people disappearing suddenly and all of the other people being left behind to go through seven years of tribulation. It, it's amazing to me how you can take something, lift it up out of Scripture, construct a false understanding of something, but reinforce it among people simply by turning it into a novel, a series of books, or a movie, especially a movie. If you can create a movie and get people to see it. I'm on it. <laughs> okay. I've... Yeah. So uh, you hear in the background there, my uh, Siri, once again, is monitoring my voice without my permission and, and she's trying to search for these movies because she hears me talking about them uh, so you see <laughs> the very uh, the, the technology uh, that has allowed us to be able to create movies and books and and uh, things it takes something that is not even real, but it makes it appear to be real. And then people begin to believe that what they see in these books and movies actually uh, represent spiritual truth. And they've, they've probably never even gone to scripture and, and studied it for themselves. They just followed what someone else said. So I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just asking you to, not take my word for it, but to take God's word for it and just make sure it's God's word and not someone else repeating what they say is God's word. So we mentioned uh, the breastplate of faith and love, the helmet of salvation. This is the beginning of Paul's development of this image of being clothed with the whole armor of God, something that he develops more fully in Ephesians 6. And he, he says here to to comfort one another and realize that God has not appointed us to wrath. And again, this has been used to try and prove a pre-tribulation rapture, but it, it, it doesn't prove that at all. It refers to the final judgment. It does not prove a pre-tribulation rapture. But my bottom line here is that our whole notion of tribulation and rapture 
it all needs to be re-examined in the light of Scripture. We don't need to take our instruction from what books and movies and prophecy teachers tell us. The same people predicting the date of Jesus' return usually believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. So what does that tell you? All of these predictions have been wrong. Therefore, their teachings, as well as their predictions, are suspect. We need to go to the Word of God and search it for ourselves. Instead of speculating and making predictions, we should walk in the light and walk in love. And so Paul gives them some simple, practical instructions for daily living and for encouraging one another and also for correcting those who are going astray. Verse 12, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So I really love that. You know, with all the speculations and, and the missed predictions and so forth, Scripture still says, don't quench the spirit and do not despise prophecies. But it does say to test all things. So when when I name these names and I point out their predictions of Christ's return and I uh, point out how they made mistakes and missed those predictions, um, this is to to educate and to instruct us not to get into the date setting business and not to fall for it because they will continue to do those things. Maybe not those specific people. You know, once you've missed it once or twice or three times, perhaps you'll, you'll stop. Maybe you'll learn, Hey, wh whatever I'm doing, I'm, I keep getting it wrong. So I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, it, that doesn't stop some people, but there will always be these sorts of predictions. So scripture says, test all things and hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. So then we come to uh, verse 23 and the final few verses as we begin to wrap up First Thessalonians. Verse 23 says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord, by the Lord, that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So it's interesting here in, in this verse 23 in particular that the traditional concept of man, uh, apart from scriptural revelation, we tend to hear mankind being described as a body and soul, the outward and the inward, the visible and the invisible. Scripture gives us an extra dimension. And it reveals that man is just like God in the sense that God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and man also is a trinity, spirit, soul, and body. Three separate and yet one. Scripture also reveals that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about that in First and Second Corinthians. And as a, as a temple, we know that the temple in Jerusalem, the temple that Paul was thinking of, was also comprised of three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and then in the very center, where the presence of God dwelt, was the Holy of Holies. And so Scripture says we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. 
Well, it doesn't say that. We imply that um, because from Paul's prayer, and, um, and and then we can extrapolate from other scripture references as well that we have a spirit, or we are a spirit, I should say. We are a spirit. Our spirit is one with the Lord. Our spirit will live forever with him. So we are a spirit. We have a soul. That is, we have mind, will, and emotions. And we live in a body. And it's easiest to see the body because that's the outward thing. And that's usually the thing that we pay attention to. The outward appearance of things. Um, but note the order in this verse in First Thessalonians 5.23. Paul is praying that God would sanctify them completely. And what does complete sanctification mean? Well, it means that your whole spirit and soul and body would be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But note the order. He doesn't say body, soul, and spirit. He says spirit, soul, and body. And that's because the innermost spirit is first and foremost. That's the part that lives forever. Next is the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions, and the body is last. So in the divine order of things, it's the same as the, the temple, as the Holy of Holies was the most important, then the inner court, and then the outer court. So there, very briefly, we see uh, how we are made, how we are constructed as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that it is God's will to sanctify us completely. Now, we're not there yet, but the scriptural hope is that when Christ returns, it says that the dead will in Christ will be raised. And also we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And in other scriptures, we understand that to mean a new body for us. So all very fascinating, all very exciting, so long as we don't try to predict when all of this is going to happen. So while the timing of Christ's return has indeed fascinated his followers for 2,000 years and continues to fascinate, I think from our study we we can find and take away two things that are very clear. First, we cannot know the day or the hour of his return. So there's no need to speculate. But secondly, and this is the good news, the day of his return is sooner now than it ever has been. And so our responsibility, and I do believe that we are living in the last days and have been, our responsibility in the meantime is not to speculate on something we cannot know, but to live according to what we do know. That is, to walk in love, to be a light in the darkness, and to share the life and testimony of Jesus with one another and with the world around us. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.